have your Bibles with you this morning, we have to turn to Hebrews, Hebrews chapter 6, and uh, while you're turning there, uh, remember Sister Castle, uh, she texted me and was all ready to row and Tilly got sick, and so you pr prayed for Tilly that he would get to be feeling better, and I kind of can identify with him, uh, so uh, you pray for them and pray the Lord would be with them. The book of Hebrews chapter 6, and we're going to begin reading in verse 13. Uh, while you're turning there, I was, uh, this is not my usual Bible. I've lost my Bible that I use most of the time, and I uh, hope it's a work. But um, uh, I was, the text that Brother Junior used this morning, I was looking, and I always write down preachers that I hear preach that text. And one of them uh, was Brother Garner Smith on August the 3rd, 2003. And, of course, he's gone home to be with the Lord. And one of them was Wayne Adams on the very same day. So they, I must have been in a meeting somewhere. Um, but uh, it's interesting how history goes. Hebrews chapter 6, beginning in verse 13. Hebrews 6, in verse 13. The Bible says, For when God made a promise to Abraham, because he could swear by no greater, he swore by himself, sure, saying, Surely blessing I will bless thee, and multiplying I will multiply thee. And so after he had patiently endured, he obtained the promise. For men verily swear by the greater, and an oath for confirmation is to them at the end of at the end of all strife wherein God willing more abundantly to shew unto the heirs of, of promise the the immutability of his counsel confirmed it by an oath that by two immutable things in which it was impossible for God to lie we might have a strong consolation who have fled for refuge to lay a hold upon the hope set before us, which hope we have as an anchor of the soul, both sure and steadfast, and which entereth into within the veil, whether the forerunner, whither the forerunner is for us entered, even Jesus made a high priest forever after the order of Melchizedek. Let's pray. Dear Lord, we thank you and praise you that you never change. Lord, that you're the same this morning as you was uh, yesterday. And as far as history can take us and beyond, you're still the same. Lord, and as far as the future may be and when eternity begins, that we would see you there. That all things in you are even the same. Lord, we change and people change and uh, leadership changes, but you never do. And we praise you for that. Allow us the grace to rely on you more and more. And we pray these things in the name of Jesus. Amen. Amen. Now, uh, this morning we'll be preaching on keep depending on God. Now, I say that because of this. The only thing in this life that you can depend on is God. And the reason I say this, everything else changes. But God is immutable. Immutable means unmoving. Always the same, steadfast. Everything else changes. And uh, in the 50 years that I've lived, I've seen almost everything turn upside down and totally different than when I was a, a boy Bella's age. That it is just a strange place to live when you compare the two. And the reason why is because men change it. And their change, society's change, say what you will, is always for the worse. And the reason I can say this, the Bible says very clearly that things will wax worse and worse. And so as time goes by, the government, and I don't care who's president, I don't care who's the speaker of the house, things are going to decline. And, and that not, may not seem good news this morning, but it is good news in this, our God does not change. He is the same yesterday, today, and forever, and on that you can depend. And, and you know, as I think about that, the most glorious thing, and I don't understand, 
understand people who don't under, who do not believe the security of the believer because how can he change your attitude, his attitude against you? It's impossible. That is uh, that herein hinges uh, the uh, the confidence that I have in the Lord Jesus Christ. Verse thirteen, the Bible says. For when God made promise to Abraham. Now, again, you can, you can write this down. If God made a promise, he's going to keep it. He's going to stay with it. He's going to stick with it. And you know what? That should be exciting to us. When, when we can't depend on everything, on anything else, it should be a thrilling thing that we can depend on God. But you know what? I believe this. We've gotten so used to it, we don't even believe it anymore. And we hear it so much, it means nothing to us whatsoever. But you know what? God is dependable. God is going to do exactly, exactly what He's promised to do, and, and He'll do it though, and, and this is the catch, He'll do it in His own time, and we want to know when, and we want to control it, and we want to understand it, and you know what, when you have all those big pieces, where's your faith? If I, if I know where, if I know exactly the day something's going to occur, such as the catching away of God's people, it takes away my faith. Because you know about it. You, you know exactly when it's come. I don't know when it's going to come. But I do know this. I have faith that it will come. And that's where faith begins. So as he's beginning to talk about the Abrahamic covenant. He says this. For when God made promise to Abraham. Because he could swear by no greater. He swear by himself. So God says uh, this to Abraham. Uh, I'm going to raise of you a great nation, and I promise on myself that you will be a bearer of many. And he made that covenant, and he promised to keep it. What a glorious thing that he did. In verse 14, saying, Surely blessings I will bless thee, and multiplying I will multiply thee. Now, I want you to not notice two things. His financial blessings came, and, and we're going to glimpse at this uh, for a moment this morning. We don't have time to go into everything God did for Abraham, but he kept that promise. Now, he also said this, in multiplying thee, <laughs> I, I, I will multiply. And you know what? Even then, God knew about Hagar. God knew about Keturah. He knew all the wives that would be because he said, I'm going to multiply you multiple times. Uh, did, did it surprise him that Abraham violated the law? Did it surprise him that Sarah had so much uh, uh, influence over him? No, he knew it from the beginning. And so he made a multiple covenant here and said, listen, I see this coming. I know, I know what's going to occur. And he, uh, he, he promised him. He, he, he promised it would be that way. Verse 15. And so after he had patiently endured. So the covenant was entered. And then came the hard part. Patiently endured. Uh, how patient are you? How, how much do you want things your way? You know, really, patience is the opposite of always getting your way. Now, you know, you know, children, babies are born in this world with a drive to have it their way all the time. And you have to whip that out of them. And if you don't, you know what? They'll come into an adult world, they, uh, an, al an adult world, thinking they are, that they ought to get thirty dollars an, uh, an hour to flip burgers. And, and so we need to understand that when we come into parenting, that they need a realistic job. I mean, a, a realistic view of how of how society works. And so he says here uh, that it takes patience. Uh, and we're going to look at the years, not the days, not the months, but the years of patience it took for the promise to be fulfilled. It took literally years. 
You know, you know where Armenian theology say this little prayer and everything's going to be super good? It come from lack of patience. It really did. Lord, I want you to save my children. I have prayed for my children to be saved literally since some of them, uh, literally since they've been born. And so far, you know what? I've got two out of four. You know what I need to do? I need to be patient. 25 years. Have you ever prayed anything for anything for 25 years? I don't think that I have. And, and, and so we, as the Lord's people, when, when we know that there's a promise of God, what we need to do is be patient. We do not need to uh, try to hurry things along. So he says, and so after, uh, uh, verse 15, and so after he had patiently endured, and that endured means hardships. It means he went through some things. It means he went through some difficulty. Uh, if it wasn't hard, it would say patiently enjoyed, but it says he patiently endured. Now, we are not a people geared that way to endure hardship in a patient way. And so after he had patiently endured, he obtained the promise. For men verily swear by the greater, and an oath for confirmation is to them an end of all strife. And, and so he was saying that many people enter into a covenant of peace to end strife, to, to let the war be over, to let peace abide. But that wasn't the object of this covenant. That I, just because it was going to, it was going to take some hardships. It was going to take some difficulty. It was not going to be smooth. You know, you know what? We in the flesh desire smooth sailing. Do we not? Never a problem. Never a care. But you know what? This, this is the truth. It's not going to happen. It's not going to be an everyday, you know, calm sea, easy going, get to where you're going quickly. There are going to be hard, hard days. And he says here that their oath did not end the problem. Verse 17, wherein God, uh, wherein God willing more abundantly to show unto the heirs of promise the immutability of his counsel. Now, what he's saying there uh, to to illustrate to them the immutability, he put them through the ringer to show them that he does not change and he will be faithful to his covenant. He showed he brought them in the hard way. It's a, see, a lot of times we think God changes, don't we? We think God has forgotten us. We think that God is, is no longer in our lives. And when we find out, he's been there all the time. He, he, he's carried us through. He's immutable. He cannot possibly violate what he said that he would do. And that's why I can't understand these people that don't believe that their salvation is secure in Jesus. What you're really doing is saying God can change. Right? And, and, and so we as the Lord's people, we need to understand that our Lord is immutable and unchangeable and, and, and that we can depend on everything that he ever says. And so um, the rest of verse 17 uh, confirmed it by an oath. He promised, he said, this is how it's going to be. Verse 18, that by two immutable things. Now, you think about all that you've seen in your life, and have you ever really known anything here that is immutable? And I'll answer for yourself, no. You know, uh, our government was conceived purely on liberty for the people, by the people. And you know what? Our supposed representatives uh, in Congress, both houses of Congress, the House of Congress and, have this, and the House of Senate today, they think they rule over you. Listen, they're not our rulers. They're our representatives. They're supposed to be carrying out what we want. 
And that's changed in my lifetime. They are not our rulers, but they would have you to believe that. Uh, that's in, you know, that, that's changed. It's mutable. It, 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 it's cushiony. When, when I was a young boy at Carlisle, there were three stores in that little, little village back then. Every one of them was closed on Sunday all day long. The one that's left, you can go down there and buy beer right now. See, it's changed. And, and, and it's influenced by what goes on. So I would dare, dare say, uh, irregardless of your age, everything is different now than when you were a child. It's, it's changed. It's mutable. And the reason why we, you know, when he cursed this earth to sin with Adam and Eve, it immediately changed, and it's been changing ever since. And, and so we as Lord's people, uh, if we find this priceless gift of two immutable, unchanging things, we should, uh, we should grasp onto them with everything that we got. That, that by two immutable things in which it was impossible for God to lie, so when he makes a covenant, he's going to keep it because it violates his character to lie, we might have a strong consolation. The first thing that is immutable with God is his counsel, uh, his uh, ability to console us, a strong consolation. You know what? When things are rough and things were, are hard, you'll have people come by and say, everything's going to be all right. That's a nice thing to say, but listen, when you're sitting on the receiving end, it's hard to believe it. When Judy died... Countless friends, Larry, it's going to be all right. Was it? You know what? My sister's still dead. We're eight years out. It's not all right, right? I had to accept the situation as it was. That doesn't mean it's all right. It's not okay with me that Judy died. But I had to accept it. But when you come to God, what a wonderful hope. Well, what a glorious thing. That's something that you can depend on uh, different than uh, any kind of consolation. And you know what? Those people that did that for me and those people, they were caring, loving friends. But there's no consolation in this world save this. If you're saved, you're going home to glory. There is no other consolation. You know what? Most of the time, this is a really miserable place to live. It is a hard thing. I was telling Donna on, on the way we went, uh, uh, this morning on the way to church. You know what? Uh, we talk about retirement. And some people say, well, I'm always going to do this. You know what? I, I'm not going to worry about retirement. And as much as I love nursing, you know what? Uh, come 70 years old, I'm done. Uh, I, I don't have an issue with that. Uh, there's comfort. We need to understand that everything changes but God. Everything changes. So where's your consolation coming from? Where's your encouragement coming from? If it's coming anywhere but God, it's going to change. It's going to be different than it was yesterday. You know what? Uh, how many of you thought ever in your lifetime this sodomite man that's, that's thrown his hat in for president he announced his presidential con uh, uh, campaign on Monday and then kissed his male husband after he announced that how many of you believe that would ever happen in the country that we live in you know what the United States is mutable it's changeable but God's not you know what do you ever know that the scriptures speak nothing of the United States, not even in prophecy? So we can go down. We don't have to be a nation. God's been good to us. But there does not have to be a United States of America. And listen, if our government keeps going in the direction that it's going, I don't think it will be. But my God is immutable. It's a wonderful thing. And one of his immutable qualities is his strong consolation. In the time of the storm, he says, peace be still. 
That's a wonderful thing, is it not? That's consolation. Uh, the rest of that verse says, who, who have fled for refuge? You know, that's a line. A, a, a songwriter made that uh, into a line. Who have, who have fled to Jesus for rest? Is he your, your refuge? Listen, there's a storm going on. And listen, there's a bigger storm brewing. I just read on my phone this morning, it beat me and I looked over there. And, and listen, I understand what Catholics are, I really do. But you know what? They were bombed today by Muslim extremists like uh, right after we got to church nine minutes earlier. Listen, they are taking over. Where else will your consolation be? Don't you, don't you have consolation in this army of ours? It's a great army. And, and I love serving veterans. But listen, there's no power against what's happening. The only consolation that you have is Jesus. And if you don't know him, you don't have a consolation. Zero. Not nothing. Nothing if you don't know the Lord Jesus Christ. And so we as the Lord's people, we ought to be excited and, and, and glad that we have such a non-changing God. Verse 19, the second immutable thing, which hope we have as an anchor. Now, now a lot of people today, and, and there's a lot of hopes in the Bible and I'm going to tell you the definition of the word here. And the next time you read about all the hopes that the, the Church of Christ says that you're only hoping. My dear Amish friends, they have a blessed hope. But praise be to God, I have more than that. But do you know what hope means in this context? Expectation. It doesn't mean hope like I hope that I'll finally be six. You know what? I'm not ever going to, I want to be six foot when I was a kid. Made it to 5'10", never made it to 6 foot, now I'm shrinking, I'm 5'9". But that's just a hope, like we think of hope. You, you know, uh, that, that you, it would be great if that happened. But an expectation is something different. It means that you believe it's going to happen. That, that all the elements are in place and it is going to happen. So when he says you have this blessed hope, when you have this hope... It's an expectation. You know what? I expect the sun to rise tomorrow. And you know what? If the Lord don't come back, it will. That's the type. It's an expectation. It, it's looking forward to something. Which hope or expectation we have as an anchor for the soul. Now... You know, I don't know much about ships, but I, I've seen the big anchors, and, and they really have two, two ways they work. One way is it hopes the, the hooked anchor is that it'll go down and it'll catch on something, like a big rock or something. And then there are other ones. My brother was in the Navy, and he said, really, this is what's used in the modern day, is huge iron balls. And they're designed to go down and to land in the sand underneath the ocean floor and to go in the ocean floor. And that's a secure, secure anchor. That's our hope. You know what? Storms are coming. Difficulties will arise. Do you have the anchor? Do you have the hope? Do you have one of these immutable, changeless facts that God is with you? That he's got you anchored down. And yes, the storm's coming. Yes, the wind's going to blow. Yes, it's going to be all hell break loose on this earth one day. But you're anchored and safe in the arms of Jesus. Do you have that? Because you know what? There's nothing else this world has to offer. Not homes, land, automobiles. Nothing that this world has to, to offer that's immutable. Nothing present in this world that does not change. And so we find that these are the only things that we have. Uh, for uh, verse 19, which hope we have is an anchor of the soul, both sure and steadfast, which endureth into that would which endureth into that 
within the veil. Now, in that portion, we get into Christ being our anchor, because the only worthy one to go into the veil, and, and you know, the Bible says this, uh, at, at the time of the death of Christ, that the veil in the temple ripped from top to bottom. You know what? That's a secure, secure place to be. Are you in Christ? See, salvation is so watered down today that there are a lot of falsehoods out there that teach you you, you can be baptized into Christ. You know, that, that's, never where, that's never taught in the scripture at all. But it sounds good, don't it? Dunk me and I'm good to go. But there's no security in that. So when these people say, yeah, I'm saved, but I may be lost again. And you know, I thought this was so pitiful. When I, when I was a younger nurse, this denomination was always afraid they was going to lose their salvation. And I mean people that had sick, sick brains. They, they were totally gone mentally because of Alzheimer's disease. And their family sincerely worried that they was going to say a cuss word and die and go to hell after holding out faithful, whatever they mean about that, for all those years. You know, how sad. What a miserable way to live. You know what? All that saying is this, that God can change. When he said he could. That he, when he said, hey, I'm immutable. I, I, I have no change. So, I want to look very quickly for time's sake in the life of Abraham and show you when the promise was made and show you what Abraham might have taken as a challenge to the promise. Genesis chapter 13. Genesis 13. Y'all be patient with me in this new Bible. Genesis 13 in the very first verse. And Abram. Now I will point out here. His name had not yet been changed to Abraham. And in my opinion. He had not yet been converted. Or saved. Let me say that. He had not been saved. And Abraham went up out of Egypt. He and his. I'm sorry. I'm going to read 12 first. Go back to 12 in the very first verse. Genesis chapter 12 in the first verse. Now the Lord said unto Abram, Get thee out of thy country, and from thy kindred, and from thy father's house, into the land, into the land which I will shew thee. Now I want you to notice two things. Here we have from the very beginning of God's people that we're not to be intertwined with the world. He says, Come out, go to this other place. And then I want you to see, it says he does not give them a promise of where they're going. Now, you know what? If me and Donna get in the car, and she drives 90% of the time, and uh, I like to know where we're going. She says I drive bad, and I say she drives bad. I said every time I get in that car, it's a step of faith. Uh, my faith is grown by riding with Donna. And, uh, you know, but I... I like to know where we're, uh, she just says, Let, let's get in the car. I'm like, where are we going? I'm not going to tell you. I'm not going. <laughs> right? But it would take some faith. You see what I'm saying? Abraham left everything he knew, everything he was, at 75 years old, simply because God said to. Now, could you do that? And, and I'm not 75 yet, uh, but even leaving the comforts and the, and the uh, and the, and everything that I know here in Stewart County, lived here the majority of my life, it would be hard to get up and go. And I can't imagine when I'm 75, the Lord asking me to do that, however he may. Uh, verse 2, and I will make of thee a great nation, and I will bless thee, and make thy name great, and thou shalt be a blessing. Now, I want you to notice that just a couple elements of this covenant. Uh, first one, I'll make you a great nation. Uh, I, I will bless thee, 
And thy name will be great. It means it will be remembered forever. And thou shalt be a blessing. A four part covenant. God was going to keep every one of them. Every one of them was a great blessing. Every, every one of them was a wonderful promise. That was the covenant of Abraham. Verse 3. And I will bless them that bless thee. And curse them that curse thee. And in thee shall uh, and in thee shall all the families of the earth be blessed. I think that's a foreteller of Christ. So Abraham departed as the Lord had spoken him, and Lot went with him. Immediately, Abram violates the covenant. Now, what was the covenant? You get out of the land. Now. Abraham, just like you and I, was of a sinful nature. And you know what? Nephew Lot shouldn't have been with him. Nephew Lot should have stayed with the, with the granddaddy and say, you know what? You're a bunch of heathens and you can stay here, but I am leaving. He violated the covenant. And you know what? But God didn't. Mankind will violate. But you know what? All four of those precious promises... God kept down to the T. But Abraham violated it before they even left. That is the nature of mankind. And don't get down on Abram because we would have done the same thing. And Lot went with him. And Abram was 75 years old when he departed out of Haran. And Abram took Sarai, his wife, and Lot, his brother's son, and all the substance that they had gathered and the souls that they had gotten in Haran and went forth to Go unto into the land of Canaan, and into the land of Canaan they came. Now, I want you to so, show you something else. And we know that Canaan became the promised land. But did Abraham know that when he left? The Bible said he didn't. He said, I'll, to the land I'll show you. So, why did he go there? Now, again, it's my example with Donna, and hey, we're going to go somewhere. Where are we going? I don't know. I'm not going to tell you. Take some faith, right? But he went somewhere. He went to Canaan. Now, we always like to know where we're going, right? But there's no faith in that. There's no faith in that whatsoever. What that is is logic. What is that? What that is is you deciding where. Uh, Genesis 13. Uh, in the first verse, Genesis 13. Uh, in the first verse, the Bible says this, And Abram went up out of Egypt, he and his wife, and all that he had, and lot with him unto the south. And Abraham was very rich in cattle, in silver, and in gold. See, he said, I will bless you financially, and the Lord God of heaven backed it up. He was extremely rich. And he went on his journeys unto the south, to Bethel, unto the place where his tent had been at the beginning, between Bethel and Hai, unto the place of the altar which he had made there at the first, and Abram called upon the name of the Lord. Now, I didn't read it for time's sake, but in verse 7 of the previous chapter, that's the first time God met with him, and he says, this Canaan is going to be yours. Now, he was fulfilling the covenant in verse 7 of chapter 12 and said, you know what? If God says this is yours, why would you leave? Was Abraham not violating the covenant? Certainly he was. See, mankind cannot keep a promise. Right? But God can. He, and so we see, despite the second violation, he still had Lot with him, and he, he did not stay in the promised land, and they would pay 400 years of slavery for that mistake that Abram made. Everybody gets down on, uh, on, on, jo I mean, on uh, Joseph for leading them in there to Egypt, but no, it wasn't Joseph's fault, it was Abraham's fault, because you know what, I fully believe this, if he took Canaan the first time, it would have been his. But he left. He said, who would he fought with? <laughs> when you have God on your side, you don't need an army. Right? 
And, and, and so we find then that, that Abraham again violates the covenant because it's impossible for man to keep a promise to God. Again and again, you will find that. Genesis 14, verse 5. And in the fourteenth year came Shadada or Lamor, the kings that were with him, and smote the Rephim, and smote the Rephims in Ashtaroth, in Karnine, in Z and Zuzims, in, in Ham, and the Emonites in Severe, and the Horites in the Mount of Seir, and to, and to Elephram, which is by the wilderness. And they returned and came uh, to Ishmaelot, where is Kadesh, and smote all the country of the Amalekites, and also the Amorites that dwelt in and Hazamor. And you will go on, and you will find that they were there fourteen years. Now, I say this to say, did Abraham have patience? Yes. Where were you 14 years ago? I was a 36-year-old man. All my children were still at home. The oldest, I guess, was 13 or 14. And everything was good, right? 14 years later, I'm 50 years old. My body's starting to go. Two of my sons is gone. And have four grandchildren. Fourteen years is a long time. If you think about your life in that. Fourteen years ago. Sarah. Was. Nine. I guess something like that. And. Uh, look at her now. She was a little girl. 14 years is a long time, but Abraham had made this, God had made this covenant, but he said, be patient. Be patient. At what point do you give up on God? And don't tell me you never have. Don't tell me that you've not said, forget it. Because you know what? If Abraham done it, you've done it too. And, and so we, as the Lord's people, what happens is with time, instead of our faith increasing, it decreases. Instead of being challenged, it goes away. And that is, that is uh, the nature of mankind. Genesis 15, in the first verse. After these things, the word of the Lord came to Abram in a vision, saying, Fear not, Abraham, I am thy shield and thy exceeding great reward. In verse uh, 1 of 15, we find the biggest crumbler of faith, and that is fear. Why don't you obey God? I would say if you boiled the water off, most of the time it's fear. Most of the time it's fearful of what people might say about you. Fearful that you'll lose a little dollar. Fearful that people will think you're weird. Fear. Scared. Upset. And, and so I believe what was happening here was that he was fixing to go up against the, the enemies of God. And he was saying, don't you be afraid. And he'll get a great blessing for this. But go on and do as God has told you to do. Fear is a, a destroyer of the immutability of God. Uh, 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 of your trust in the immutability of God. Genesis 16, verse 3. And Sarai, and Sarai, Abram's wife, took Hagar, her handmaid, the Egyptian, after... Now, let me just insert what here. What do you, ex, what do you suppose it inserted that Hagar was Egyptian? I guess they got her down there when they were out of the will of God to start with. Right? Where else are you going to get an Egyptian but Egypt, right? And you know what you know what Egyptians still are to this very day? They're idolaters in every sense of the word. You want an idolater living in your house? The Bible says come out from among them and be your separate, right? I don't think that's a new concept for the New Testament, do you? 
I think it's always been that way, and they were not to be. And you know what? They bought one and had her living in the house with them. Is that violating the covenant? Sure it was. They violated it, but God did not because he's immutable and he keeps his promises. We can't keep ours, but God can certainly keep his. And so they brought this idolatrous woman to live with them. And when Abram, uh, and, and Sarai's Abram's wife bare him no children, and she had a handmaid, an Egyptian, whose was, name was Hagar, and Sarai said unto Abram, Behold now, the Lord hath restrained me from bearing. I pray thee, go in into my maid, and it may be that I may obtain children by her. And Abram hearkened unto the voice of Sarai. You know what Sarah's problem, Sarai's problem was? Her faith was done. She'd run out. She was finished. You ever, you ever been to that point? I'm done. I'm just finished. I can do no more. Easy to, easy to criticize Sarai, but you know every one of us has been there. Verse 3. And Sarai, Abram's wife, took Hagar, her handmaid, uh, the Egyptian, after Abraham had dwelt ten years in the land of Canaan. Now, I'm not exactly what year we're on in their travel because you see 15 or 12 in that battle that war so I don't know if they were there part of the time and not, and not part of the time but we do find here that they've been in Canaan back in Canaan 10 years and I'm taking that to mean after they left Egypt and came back to Canaan so probably somewhere around 15 years and Sarah's done now, don't you get down on Sarah. Because after 15 years, your faith would be shackled to. You're believing that my God is able would get pretty, pretty thin. And, and so we find then that uh, in all of her wisdom, Sarah says, I know what we can do. I have a slave over here. You go in into the slave. And you know what? It was the worst mistake that could happen. But you know what? God kept his promise. Because out of Ishmael came 12 tribes as well. See, God keeps up his end even when we don't. You see, he is a very, very faithful God. And, and he will keep his promises time and time again. So was he, was he deliberately rising up a, a group to fight the armies of Israel? No. He was simply keeping his promise. And if there was another son, there had to be nations. And it certainly happened. And you know what? The Ishmaelites, even to this day, even to this very morning, is still causing problems today. And they always will. That, that's who they are. Verse 7. Chapter 17 in the first verse. And when Abram was 90, 90 years old and 90. Now, few and far between, but I met, I've met several people past this, at this point and past. Oldest person I ever met was 110 years old. His parents were freed slaves from Houston County. I was 18, I guess. So, when I was 17, I think he was born somewhere around 1877. It, it, he's very, still just right on it. Clear as a bell. But, uh, you know what? And we all called him Pappy. I don't even remember his real name. I don't know what it was. Everybody called him Pappy. Uh, I don't think he could have had children at that age. See what I'm saying? Sarah was 90. <clears throat> Think a 90 year old could have children? I do, but it's only with the intervention of God. We know Sarah I did, Elizabeth did. I'm not sure how old Elizabeth was. Everybody says she was 90 as well, but I don't see where they get that from the Bible because it doesn't tell us that. But I do know that God had to intervene. And, and, and so we as the Lord's people, uh, if you have faith, you can believe it. But I want you to see as God is beginning to keep his promise to him. And he does, the, the promised child comes. 
The promised child is, is finally given, and if he had just been, so why could he not just wait on God? And I'll tell you, this is the reason, and this is the reason for us too. They ju we just can't concept that God is immutable. He doesn't change. He made a promise and said, hey, I'm going to keep it. But it took 25 years. You know what? In the whole scheme of things, that's not very long. 25 years ago, I was 25. I had two children, one on the way. And, uh, you know, uh, it, it's gone by like that. And when we look at life like, like that, how do we get discouraged in the promises of God? But we do, do we not? My, uh, the Bible says this, Ray, train up your children in the ways that they should go, and when they are old, they will not depart from it. Yeah. You know what? I'm trusting that for the salvation of every one of my children. But it's a long time, is it not? Yeah. Take some waiting. Take some patience. And so we as the Lord's people, I, I ask you this morning, uh, do you really believe the immutability of God? Do you, do you believe He's faithful to His promises? Do you believe that He is uh, steadfast and true? I do. I believe someday... I hope it's soon, and sometimes even in preaching I say it soon. But you know, this is the true fact. I don't know when Jesus is coming. And things are bad, <laughs> but as my mama always say, they could be worse. <laughs> so I don't know when Jesus is coming, but I know that he is. And until that time, I'll just stand still. And you know what? Believing any other thing means that you think God can change. Right? There's a whole doctrine out there that teaches that, that Christ already came and we're living in the kingdom years. Mm -hmm. yeah. But you know what? That's not true. That would mean that God is changeable, right? So what do you believe about the character of God? Do you really believe His faithful and true promises? Certainly I do. Certainly I claim them. And daily, if you want to be happy, if you want to be glad when the earth, when, when, when the kingdoms of the earth are literally falling away, listen, you believe that God's immutable and He's made us a promise that everything's going to be alright. And you claim to that when, when things are at its hardest. 